Everyone knows The Twilight Zone. It's probably one of the most famous TV shows ever to air. There are references literally everywhere you look in fiction. They even made a Disney theme park ride out of it. Sort of. But, and be honest here, have you ever actually watched it? There'll probably be a bunch of sci-fi buffs in the comments saying they have, but for the average person, I would absolutely put my money on the answer being no. It's not exactly a show that feels approachable these days. It's old and it's in black and white, and I think for viewers with more modern sensibilities, that might just send your brain into screensaver mode. Fortunately, I don't really have that problem. I rarely watch TV myself, and when I do, it's usually something we plan to do a video on. But this time, my human co-writers didn't seem to have any interest. Like most people, although they know about it, the Twilight Zone just wasn't on their to-watch list, and they couldn't really think of a good way to make a video about it. Honestly, I get it, but I'm just tired of seeing all these interesting references and not knowing what it's all about. So, I think it's time to take matters into my own hands. I don't have any clever point to make or anything like that in this video. I'm just finally going to take a moment to watch this thing and tell you what that's like. Okay? Okay. Be warned, this video will of course contain spoilers for some of the most beloved episodes of the original Twilight Zone series. Not that I thought you were going to watch it anyway, but you know, after hearing me talk about it a little, you might just want to, and I want you to have that option. So, okay, here I go. Now entering the Twilight Zone. Okay, normally we put a little sponsor plug right here. This is where I mention it in passing, so you're not surprised when it comes up later. But this time is very different. Our sponsor for this video isn't trying to sell you anything at all. Not even sort of. They're a non-profit organization called 80,000 Hours, and their entire mission is to help you find the most meaningful, most fulfilling career you possibly can. They've done loads of research for you, They've made guides, podcasts, job listings, everything you could want, all entirely for free because they believe that when people are doing things that actually matter to them, things that make a real difference in the world, the world becomes a better place far faster. It's still kind of hard to wrap my head around the fact that they're literally paying us to help you get access to this free tool that could change your entire life. But there it is. What a weird, wonderful thing. Please, take this opportunity. Who knows when it will come again? Visit 80,000hours.org slash tailfoundry to get started. Well, that was not quite what I was expecting. No wonder this show is so popular. I obviously have a lot to say, but let me give you a little background before I get into it. The Twilight Zone aired from 1959 to 1963. It's science fiction, mostly. There's some horror in there too, some mystery, some paranormal fantasy, but its main reputation is that of a pioneer in the sci-fi genre. That's because most science fiction shows back then were more focused on adventure. Superheroes, giant killer ants, aliens, robots, space princesses in skimpy outfits, that kind of stuff. The Twilight Zone, by contrast, is subtle. It wanted not just to scare or excite its audience, but to make them think. Basically, The Twilight Zone was one of the first TV shows to take science fiction seriously. And because it became so popular, it was also what opened many Americans' eyes to the possibilities of speculative fiction in general. Okay, that's the background. It was a different time, and you would expect that to affect the experience of watching it, right? Well, not really. I have to admit, I did think The Twilight Zone would be kind of hard to watch, even for me. I don't know, I just thought it would be full of references I didn't understand and jokes that I'm sure were hilarious. 
in 1959. At the very least, I thought the painfully dated visual effects would be an obstacle for me. And, okay, I mean, there is a little of that. Like, there's this one, actually one of the most well-known episodes, where a man who's recently recovered from a nervous breakdown starts seeing a monster outside his airplane window. Whenever he tries to make someone else look, mysteriously, it isn't there for them to see. The episode itself is fantastic, but the monster is. Uh, well, I mean, look at this thing. Is monster really the right term? It looks more like a guy wearing a 70s shag carpet or, I don't know, a Muzzy costume? Do you remember Muzzy? And I've got to be honest, that does undermine the tension a little bit. Never mind all the cheesy, old-fashioned cinematography. Push-ins, freeze frames, that sort of stuff. Oh, and the sound design. But there are way less of those moments than I expected there to be. And really, the episodes themselves are just so intriguing. Even when the effects were quite bad, I didn't actually care that much anyway. And we have... Shocker, plain old good writing to blame for that. Actually, the writing is something I really want to talk about. There's this weird feeling I had hanging over me while watching this show. Everything just felt so obvious, in a way. Some of these episode premises, incredibly original in their day, have been copied and parodied so much that the originals now seem almost uninspired just because we've run across them so many times before. Like, there's this one episode called The Eye of the Beholder that opens with a woman whose head is completely covered in bandages, bemoaning her hideousness, and all the normal characters in the episode are filmed with their faces conveniently hidden from the camera. Okay, got all that? Now, I dare you to guess the episode's twist. Go on, I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay. Did you, by any chance, guess that underneath those bandages, she's actually beautiful and everyone else around her is actually some kind of weird-looking monster? Because if so, ding ding ding, you are correct. It seems cheesy, right? That kind of plot twist only works if you don't see it coming. But imagine if you just watched this back in the day and this plot hadn't been done over and over again. It would feel like you're witnessing the birth of a classic, and I guess, in a sense, you would have been. It isn't always like this, though. Some episodes are bizarre or clever enough that, although you may have seen them referenced over and over again, when you finally see them in context, the twist still manages to knock the wind out of you. For instance, if you haven't watched the most famous episode of The Twilight Zone, Time Enough at Last, even though there are plenty of references to it in media, you still probably wouldn't be able to guess the plot twist going into it. It's about a beleaguered bank worker named Henry who wants nothing more than time alone to read, which is infuriatingly hard for him to find. He's sabotaged at work by his angry boss and at home by his cruel, inexplicably book-hating wife. One day, he decides to hide in the bank vault at work to sneak in a little reading time. And while he's in there indulging his intellectual vice, twist, a nuclear apocalypse occurs, leaving him all alone in the world. Yep, complete left hook. After emerging into the new wasteland and wandering for several days, Henry finally falls into despair and decides to take his own life. And then it happens. He stumbles upon the ruins of the public library. And here's the second twist. After the world ends, he finally realizes that he now has what he's been craving this whole time. Time enough at last to read. All the time in the world. And then, twist number three, and the cruelest of all, he accidentally drops his reading glasses and shatters them. The episode ends with Henry repeating over and over, That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I've seen remakes of this exact scene over and over, images parodying it, plot arcs and shows creating new takes on it. And even still, after all of that, it gave me chills. 
or whatever you call the robot version of chills. Oh, and still on the topic of writing, I have to say, the monologues are amazing. It's not something you see in basically any media anymore, but they carry such an emotional punch. After the main intro, each episode opens with a narration by the creator, Rod Serling, describing the premise of the episode. That wasn't unusual in early TV shows. The first season of Leave it to Beaver did it too, but the opening monologues for The Twilight Zone are actually really, really good. Listen to this. The prostrate form of Mr. David Ellington, scholar, seeker of truth, and regrettably finder of truth. A man who will shortly arise from his exhaustion to confront a problem that has tormented mankind since the beginning of time. A man who knocked on a door seeking sanctuary and found instead the outer edges of the Twilight Zone. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't it give you chills? <sighs> Sorry, it's just very exciting for me to see good writing put front and center like that. Boy, did Rod Serling know how to write. Each episode has a closing monologue, too, and they all end with the phrase, The Twilight Zone. Or almost all of them. There are a few where it doesn't, and it's never an accident. Like, here's the outro for The Monsters Do on Maple Street, which is about a suburban neighborhood whose residents come to believe that there's an alien imposter among them and tear themselves apart in paranoia. The tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallout. There are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill, and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all of its own, for the children and the children yet unborn. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the Twilight Zone. These days, that feels like a bit of a critique on American politics, how even among your political peers, once someone demonstrates less than perfect party ideals, it's all out war. Within the context of the time period it aired, it's actually a perfect allegory for the Red Scare. Like, almost flawless. And I looked into this. Apparently, that's because Rod Serling, the man behind the mystery, was a master of social commentary. It turns out that was kind of his whole deal. From what I read, it seems that Serling took up writing to help him cope with his experience fighting in World War II, where he was stationed in the Philippines helping root out the Japanese occupation. After apparently getting on his commanding officer's bad side somehow, Serling was assigned to a unit nicknamed the Death Squad, which had something like a 50% casualty rate. He experienced an unimaginable amount of loss and trauma during his service. Some of this was expected, some completely out of the blue. One time he watched his friend, in the middle of delivering a comedic monologue to boost the spirits of the men, get decapitated by a friendly supply drop in a freak accident. When he returned to the States, it was with a knee injury and severe PTSD that left him experiencing nightmares and flashbacks for the rest of his life. Bitter and angry about the pointlessness of war, Serling vented his emotions in writing short stories. During Serling's heyday, he was known as Hollywood's angry young man for his clashes with censors and advertisers. Even before Twilight Zone, when he was writing for radio and other TV shows, he had issues. In 1958, a year before The Twilight Zone started airing, he wrote this script for the show Playhouse 90 called a Town Has Turned to Dust, about a lynching in a southern town inspired by the murder of Emmett Till. But the TV executives forced him to change the black victim to Mexican in the time period to the 1800s to avoid angering white southern viewers. And okay, that might just come with the territory of writing controversial stuff about real-world issues, but that wasn't always the case. The line, got a match, from another of his early teleplays, Requiem for a Heavyweight, had to be cut because Playhouse 90 was sponsored by Ronson Lighters. Basic industry censorship. Serling realized he could make much more controversial statements using speculative fiction, removed from the audience in space and time, than he could just writing realistic fiction about contemporary social issues. So, that's what he did. He took all that energy, all that progressive anger, 
and poured it into the Twilight Zone. In its five-year run, it tackled topics like racism, beauty standards, and conformity. And death, of course. Serling never forgot the war that made him begin writing in the first place, and it's everywhere in the Twilight Zone. He said the first season episode, The Purple Testament, which is about a soldier who develops the ability to tell which men are going to die in the same area of the Philippines where he himself served. And at least some of the names of the dead in that episode are the names of the fallen soldiers he served with, including Levy, the man who was decapitated by the supply drop. Here's the intro to that episode, written and directed by Serling. These are the faces of the young men who fight. As if some omniscient painter had mixed a tube of oils that were at one time earth brown, dust gray, blood red, beard black, and fear yellow white. And these men were the models. For this is the province of combat. And these are the faces of war. So, I have finally visited the Twilight Zone and learned a little about it. This thing that is everywhere in media. A classic that informed all of speculative fiction to come after. And I have to say, I didn't think I would like it this much. Not only are these genuinely great stories, but they also offer a window into so many different things. The brave new world of early television, the anxieties of the 50s and 60s, the timelessness of good critical thinking, and the mind of a legend, Rod Serling. Before watching it, I thought it was just campy pulp fiction. I thought these were classics because they were novel and fun, and that most of the appeal would have worn off by now. But it turns out you don't create a classic that permeates culture this deeply just by putting a man in a muzzy suit or spinning a door around in space. You do it by exploring interesting ideas. I only talked about a few episodes in this video, but I bet you want to know what happens to the woman who buys a thimble on the ninth floor of an eight-floor department store, don't you? The newlyweds who discover a machine that can tell the future? The hypochondriac who makes a deal with the devil for complete invulnerability? Come on, I know you do. And there's only one way to find out. I think it's time you entered the Twilight Zone. By which I mean, go watch it. Trust me. Actually, in some ways, life is a little weirder and a little bit scarier than the Twilight Zone. Sometimes it can feel like you're just trapped in an alternate reality, nowhere near the life you actually want to be living. Did you know that most people spend about 80,000 hours of their life just working? Doing tasks to get money to pay for the things they need. Don't you wish sometimes that you could just get out of that grind? Spend that time to make a difference in the world? There has to be a way to work your career, earn your bread, and feel like your existence is meaningful at the same time, right? A better way to spend those 80,000 hours? Well, I'm here to tell you that there is. And this is barely a sponsor spot because there's no sell, no product. Nothing at all for you to spend your money on. This really is me purely telling you that there's a way to make a real impact on the world and that you really can find work that will allow you to create legitimate change. There are incredible, meaningful jobs out there that you may never even have thought of. And you don't have to go find them on your own or chance upon them, because today, our sponsor is ready to help you. Let me introduce you to 80,000 Hours a non-profit organization dedicated to helping you make the most of your 80,000 career hours. They've been doing this for over 10 years, have already helped over 1,000 people find their calling, and have so many resources just waiting for you to lay hold of. With the help of hundreds of experts and academic organizations, they've studied tirelessly to figure out what career paths stand to make the biggest impact on the world, and they've laid out paths to access them as well. Turns out you don't have to be a doctor or a teacher or a charity worker to change lives. Maybe you want to be an AI safety advisor, working in a lab and making sure the robots don't get out of hand. Or maybe you want to make a career out of addressing climate change. No shortage of hands needed there. And if you're still trying to figure out what issues matter most to you personally, where you want to spend your time trying to make an impact, the website is loaded with educational materials as well. From a free guide that they give you right on the landing page of the website 
to an incredibly good podcast where they interview experts from every field, to one-on-one -on -one calls with impartial advisors who can help you find some career directions that you find promising, this site, it's built to change your life. And I can't stress enough that literally everything they offer is free. Visit 80,000hours.org slash tailfoundry to get started. An absolutely massive thanks to them for giving us the opportunity to tell you about this thing that they've created for you. Definitely one of the coolest sponsors we've had on the show. I really hope you'll give it a look. Again, that's 80,000hours.org slash tailfoundry. Imagine reclaiming 80,000 hours of your life, turning all that time from mindless labor just to put food on the table to something you feel passionate about, something that changes the world. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.